All right, so today we have Jason Shen, uh, who I'm so excited to be chatting with. I've been following his blog, The Art of Ass Kicking, for a long time. Jason, how you doing, man? It's great to be here, Scott. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. This is fun. Awesome, man. So, so tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you from? Yeah, so um, you know, I was I was born in China, but I moved to right outside of Boston when I was a, a kid and grew up outside of Boston. Uh, moved to California for college. Uh, I went to Stanford, studied biology, uh, did gymnastics there, and um, fortunate enough to be part of a, a national championship team my uh, final year at Stanford. Um, got into sort of startups pretty quickly, uh, worked at a company called iSocket, which does advertising, mm -hmm. um, and that's also when I started my blog, The Art of Ass Kicking. Uh, the past two years, I've been doing a startup called RideJoy. We were uh, funded by Y Combinator, and we help people share long-distance rides. So Dude. that's what I've been up to lately. That's awesome, man. I mean, it's you know, it's kind of funny because um, I think about the things in my life and how it's this kind of whole mezcla. Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of people who are into the same things where it's like athletics, personal develop, development, entrepreneurship. And there's kind of this like weird circle where they all kind of like flow into each other. Um, so that's really cool, man. Tell me, tell me about when you got into, uh, like, you know, you started the art of ass kicking and at that point, were you already into personal development stuff? When did you really get into this whole yeah. idea of self-improvement and that our behaviors and the things about us are really malleable things that we can change? Yeah, I actually started at a pretty young age. Um, I read my Dad had a, has a lot of books. He likes to read. I like to read. And he had a book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I mean, of course. I'm pretty sure he bought it at like a you know uh, yard sale or something. And it was just like this beat up old yellow book. And I just picked it up for whatever reason. It really resonated me, with me. I was maybe uh, 12 or 13 at that time. And just the I, it just you know. I think it's not like I, I think the book is very good. I think that everybody has a book that they're like, this is the book, and it's really because that's the eye opener. Like yep. you get a huge sort of new look, and you can't see the world the same anymore. And I think uh, the early, you know, the first book that does that to you is the one that you you talk a lot about. Um, but just the idea that you can change sort of your experience of how how life is for you by changing the way you think and changing the way you do things uh, was a really tremendous eye-opener, I guess, for me. So that's sort of where it started. Totally, man. I mean, it's crazy because, you know, I, I guess like the two paradigms I always think about it, when I talk about this stuff is like growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And once you realize and start to like become a believer in the growth mindset, it's, it just like boggles my mind that people don't think that way. Um, and you're right. It all starts. It it typically all starts with a with a certain book for somebody, and yeah. then actually like seeing some type of result that comes from that book. Yeah, I started writing like you know. So I I had like mission statements when I was like 13 and 14, and they're like they have all these things. It's just like part of me like very kept it sort of under wraps. You know, I wouldn't. You know, you talk about like goals maybe you're setting, um, but you don't you don't get too into it. And it was only over time that I've really started to um, be really open about that. Even now, I still don't, uh, I, the part of me feels a little bit uncomfortable describing what I do or talk about what I talk about as personal development, because I think there's a strong uh, negative feeling in, in yep. our culture around it. Um, and I think that that's partly because there, there was a movement at one point towards a lot of like very personality driven, very like, you know, achieve success, set these goals, like visualize sort of self-affirmations. And there's a lot of thing, things to those uh, concepts, but there's also sort of like the secret is like the, is the antithesis of everything that I think about, about personal development, right? But I think it's something that comes up a lot. It's like, oh yeah, if you just imagine it, it's just going to like come into fruition. I, I thought of this house and then four years later I was living in it. <laughs> and you're just like, God, this is, I don't want to be associated with that, you know? Um, right. So part of me, you know, so I love it. And then I also am like, 
it's like it's almost shameful which is is an awful thing to 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 have you're so right man it's like and i apologize for coworkers that are walking in the background they're they're supposed to be out of here by this time but i guess they're yeah. really hard workers um Super hard yeah. uh yeah i mean it's like it's like it's like sales right like sales is a dirty word um even though for a lot of people they're incredibly ethical and you know like lawyers a dirty word um yeah personal development definitely has that and i think it's I think it's only natural for us to, I guess, like at times, like hold that stuff close to us. But you know what the funny thing is, is that when you, I've noticed at least, like when I tell people that I'm like into like working on myself and it it, it does one of two things, like either immediately it just establishes incredible rapport and like, oh my God, you want to get good at that too? Like I didn't tell anyone, like it's amazing. Or it like really polarizes people from you and -hmm. ultimately i think about that and i'm like well if i'm attracting and developing like intimacy with people that i really like share my interests and like share my values and stuff and i'm pushing people away that are not into the same stuff and you know aren't i guess trying to become their best selves then it's it's actually kind of an efficient strategy yeah it's not it's not really bad because you can't engage everybody uh and so even in, in writing any kind of marketing message or any kind of sales message to promote a certain product, you have, you have to have like, these are the core people I want to reach and these are the people who may even be turned off by what I'm offering. And I think that that, um, that makes sense, you know, from a broader, you know, interaction perspective to say, look, I'm going to put this out there. If immediately you're not into it, that's fine. We can sort of make our piece and, and, and do our thing and, and, you know, not necessarily need to interact with each other a lot. So. I think that, that I think that's a good point. Um, yeah. I really liked your point about uh, athletics, sort of personal development and, and, and entrepreneurship, because I feel like that's a real sort of combination of the kinds of things I talk about. I think athletics often is a, is a, like a, a sneak way a sneak way into uh, personal development. Yes, uh, <laughs> dude, <laughs> because, I I yeah. have such a uh, I can't wait to talk about this. Yeah, because you know, like. With gymnastics, right, we would set goals. Like each year, you'd be like, okay, what skills do you want to learn? And then you, you're like, oh, it'd be really cool if I could learn this like double backflip. And then you realize, oh, well, to learn that, you're going to have to like get really better, uh, good at your single flip and you have to do a lot of drills. You need to get stronger and you do all these things. And you do all those things. You work hard and you're tired, but you keep going. And then a year later, you're like, oh, sh- you know, I can do a double backflip now. It's like I did all this work and it was hard and didn't work out every time, but like now I can, there's like this very concrete, like in intractable sort of accomplishment that you've achieved through putting all that effort in. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. And that makes you say, gee, if I did that with like my job or with, you know, other things in my life, what could I do? Right. I think you're totally on. And it's funny because like I, I realized that my love for, so I was a collegiate football player. Mm -hmm. Um, and I realized that, you know, I always like my whole life leading up to my professional life, it was just all about football. It was all about, you know, being successful, uh, like our team doing whatever it took to make our team win, like getting personal recognition, all that stuff. And I thought that I loved football and I do like football a lot, but what I really, (laughs) what I realized is what I really loved was getting better at something Mm -hmm. and it was the competition and pushing myself to become the best I could at something. And that was just manifested through athletics. And right. now it's like, dude, I barely even pay attention to football. Like right. I, I'll watch it and I'll be like, cool, this is cool. Like I'll watch my team. Like I don't get like the hair of my arms doesn't raise when I watch a football game. Like, yeah. I'd well, re- I think that you're like, there's a difference between people who are into football and people who like maybe even play football, you know, like, I think, like, I don't like to watch, like, I don't like to be a spectator in, in most things, right? Like, right. I watch a football game, I watch a sports game, I watch my teammates play. Like, I would rather be out there doing that stuff. And I just don't get really into, like, somebody else doing it and watching them do it and, like, getting nervous and getting, like, you know, it's fun to, like, watch a Super Bowl with buddies and things like that, but I'd rather be out there doing it. You know, I, I have a sense that maybe that's where you'd rather be, too. That's, you know? a, that's a great point. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a very valid point. Um, you know, I think uh, yeah, but I, I I just think you're 
it just really resonates me with the kind of what you said is like athletics being this kind of introduction and like almost as like a surrogate to, you know, personal development stuff. Um, I have a co uh, co-founder, my roommate, and at one point we were working out a lot uh, and he's very thin and he didn't work out a lot as a, as you know, growing up. Um, and I would say these things to him and I think sometimes he didn't get it. Like I'd be like, you know, even when you think you're like totally done, you can do another rep and things like that. And it sounds like you're like, you got more in you and, you know, and all these things. And, but like we got him going from like not being able to do a single pull up to being able to do like eight pull ups. And like, that was really good for him. And you know, when he did eight, he was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't think I could do that. And I was really tired, but I, I think thought I, didn't, I couldn't do any more, but I did like two more. Uh, and you know, again, it's like funny to see that switch, you know, he's a very high achieving person, but that opened up, I think, a, a different uh, insight for him just to see that. That's awesome, man. So, so one of my favorite, so one of, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about that I absolutely love was the whole idea of rejection therapy and that personal experiment. Um, so, you know, I've, I've checked it out on your blog, but can you kind of tell everybody a little bit about this and maybe what motivated rejection therapy? Yeah, so um, rejection therapy is something developed by a guy named Jason Comley, who was um, sort of a, a, a freelance uh, sort of uh, tech tech guy who was found himself being very introverted, working at home, not getting out there, and it was a way for him to push himself and get outside his comfort zone and be more social in a way. Uh, and I came across it, and there's this idea that he puts out of a 30 day rejection therapy challenge, where every day you need to go out and make requests and get personally rejected. So it has to be like in your face, maybe over the phone, but it can't be for work and it can't be, you know, it's got to be something that you're like really asking for and they're saying no. Um, and I found that and it really like kind of scared me because I don't like getting rejected. I mean, I don't really know anybody who does. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm not also not afraid to make requests, but I generally make them like I figure out a way to like get it, you know. Um, so I'm like pretty good at getting what I want most of the time. But there, of course, there are things where I just don't ask for because I'm like the chances are low and what's the point. Uh, so it kind of scared me to do this to like actively see the, like at the end of the day you have to get the rejection to call it a win. Right. But I also thought it was cool that it flipped it on its head and said like you know what you normally consider a failure is actually success in this game. So. I uh, I decided to do it. I don't really know why. I just got this feeling like that this was going to be pretty cool and something challenging, right? Like that, you know, we talked about growth mindset. This is something where you're going to experience a lot of discomfort. But I knew that I had a feeling that it was going to pay off somehow. So right. I started doing these, and you know, you start really basic. You're like going into a store and asking someone if they can get this shirt in a different color and they don't have it and it's like okay that's like my rejection for today but it got it got more advanced and I started asking you know at one point I asked I was on the Caltrain station I saw a guy eating a croissant and I was like oh yeah it'd be funny if I asked that guy to eat his croissant and then I was like that's stupid I'm, I'm gonna walk away now and then I was like oh oh you're gonna walk away because you're scared you know it was like right. this whole internal dialogue going through your head and I, I turned around, I was like, fine. I turned around and walked back there and I asked him if I could have a bite of his croissant. And first he was like, oh, I got the cafe over there. He, he didn't speak very good English, so he's kind of like <laughs> gesturing. And I was like, no, I, I want to eat your croissant. And he's like, just a piece. And I was like, oh, no. Like, he's going to say yes. And he gave me a piece of your croissant. And I was like, damn it. Like, I didn't even get rejected. I have to leave, you know. But... I think it was really good, you know, uh, I, I certainly asked a couple people out, it, sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't, uh, and all in all, I think it was a really, a really good sort of push experience. Totally, I mean, that is awesome. I, 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 think, I think we, uh, you know, one of the things that I love in my own, like, personal experience, like, pushing my comfort zone is the fact that, like, we think there's these set of rules that we that this is the way people do X and this is, and that's appropriate and that's not. And then you just realize that there really is no rules. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, asking a guy to eat his sandwich or talking to a complete stranger or, you know, doing something odd in the middle of the day, like it's, it's, it, there's something like incredibly empowering about 
doing these things that scare you and then coming out alive. And, you know, not only coming out alive, but like coming out, like you, you, you almost feel stronger. Like you feel invincible when you do something that, uh, you know, everyone tells you that, that you can't do and you actually are able to achieve it. Yeah. And, and as a biology major, I think a lot about sort of uh, the field of evolutionary psychology and why it is that certain things like getting rejected are so painful. And, you know, one theory that's come up is that we're a really social species and we live for a long time in small tribes of like 100 people. Um, and getting rejected and like getting kicked out of your tribe was like death. Like right. if they're not out there helping you, sheltering you, getting food and you're sharing it, like you're dead. Um, and so at one point, like it really made sense to stay in the group and to stay sort of like, like do what everyone else is doing because that was what was going to give you survival. But, you know, the world has changed faster than our sort of genetics and our sort of brain wiring has caught up to it. Uh, there are a lot less consequences for, you know, doing things that are like socially different. Um, and in fact, certain people can earn, gain a lot of, uh, of good things from breaking those norms, but it requires overcoming uh, a lot of ingrained, deep uh, sort of tendencies. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so interesting to think that like, you know, societies thousands of years ago ultimately shape our humans' behavior today. Um, yeah. That's incredible. That's awesome. So what would, so if somebody wanted to, um, start pushing their comfort zone today. Yeah. What, what would be some advice that you would give them? Yeah, I mean, I always want to have some kind of goal in mind. Um, and I think latching on to something like rejection therapy is good because it gives you a little bit of a framework uh, for, for uh, sort of justifying to yourself and other people what it is that you're doing. Um, like I taught a class at Stanford my, my final year is like a student initiated course on the psychology of personal change. And, you know, part of it was reading papers on how people change their behaviors and like quit smoking or, you know, lose weight. And part of it was doing it, applying those like principles on their own change project. And the feedback that I got, the thing that I remember the most uh, wasn't like any particular uh, a, a, like achievement or anything. It was that some people said things like uh, it gave me a reason to like tell other people what I was doing, right? It's, it, again, it's this social feeling, right? Like if you want to push yourself to become a better, uh, to, to like start exercising, it's like good to join a running group because now it's not just like, oh, all of a sudden I decided to, like your friends are like, hey, what's going on? Oh, you're putting on your gym shorts? Like, oh, that's, and then you're kind of like, well, I just thought that it might be good that, you know, what, like if you're like, okay, I joined this running club or I like, I started working with a personal trainer, like, Having a framework, having a structure to your uh, growth challenge or whatever you're trying to push yourself to do is important. So rejection therapy is like, it's a thing. You can explain to people like, oh, I'm doing this thing. Like you're still pushing yourself. It's still right. awkward. But you have, th there's that secondary awkwardness around explaining to other people what the hell you're doing. Um, so I would say like find something that you want to do and then find a, a system or a structure to like, ingrate yourself into as part of this growth experience. Totally. And it's also one of those things where I've noticed, like right now I'm trying to give up drinking. Um, and it's, I noticed a def an incredible difference when I started tracking it and it's like startup metrics, right? Like you can manage what you measure and yep. without it, you're just flying blind. Yeah. And I think that that advice, uh, around finding a framework is, is such a, a great way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you trying to quit drinking indefinitely or just for a period of time? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, if I'm honest with myself, I thought about, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm probably, I'll like have a drink, but like, I'm really trying to cut out like excess. Um, and cause fundamentally, like if I'm just completely honest with myself, like I don't drink because I want to be healthier. I don't drink because it's good for my finances. I don't drink because it's good for my personal growth. It's not good for my spiritual life. Literally, the reason I the reason I drink a lot of times is to blunt my anxieties, mm -hmm. and that's the real deal. And you know what? Like, the fact that I'm not like facing those anxieties like head on and getting control of them is holding me back. And it's just a huge crutch, and I need to get it get out of get it out of my life. Yeah, um, I think that that's uh, 
that's it's it's really uh, tough to be honest with yourself in that way, and I think it, that's that's good uh, to to recognize. Yeah, no, I mean it's not it's not easy when you go to a bar and you're like, dude, why are you drinking a club soda? And it's like, oh, I'm just trying to stop drinking to blunt my anxieties. It's like, oh, right, oh, okay. That just got really awkward really fast. You know? Yeah, but you can always—I mean, like you said—you can always you can always mask those things and say like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing a, a month off sober." Like, right. I'm doing, I'm doing yep. a month a month whatever. You don't have to always. There, there's ways you can position. You got to brand it. You got to brand yes. your thing. You know, month off, month off, or whatever, or like no meat Mondays, right? Like you know, for people who are trying to cut down on their meat consumption, it's like it's like you have to have a concept. So, um, but yeah. Yeah. That's something I never thought about is that I really like that you brought up that when you try to do one of the, something, a behavior change or whatever it is, that there's not only the challenge of actually like executing it, but rationalizing it to other people, which is why framing it in such a way is such an interesting idea. Yeah. It's just the, it's like the kind of thing that holds you, you, you have to find out the friction points, right? Um, Ramit Sethi talks about how uh, he was like wanting to go to the gym, but he always wouldn't in the morning. And a big difference that he made was just putting his shorts and like his gym bag and his shoes like right at the foot of his bed. Like it's so small. It's like it was normally in the corner in the like closet or something, and it's not that hard to get it. But reducing that friction just makes it that much easier. There's a there's a concept in biology called uh, with in rela- relationship to reactions, chemical reactions. Um, so there's the activation energy required to make the reaction happen. So you got to kind of heat it up or you got to do something to get to the point where like there's enough energy in the system to like cause the reaction to happen and then it kind of like goes downhill from there. Um, and so two ways that you can make reactions happen faster is you can either raise the heat or you can, you know, if you ever read people talk about catalysts or enzymes, what they do is they lower the activation energy. They make it so that with less heat, you can still get the reaction to happen. So I think about that as like, as like, you know, reduce the activation energy and raise the heat. So the heat is kind of like your motivation, like how pumped up you are to do this. Like, you know, your, your dad just had a stroke, like, oh, shit, I need to get healthy. Um, so that raises the motivation and the heat. But then on the other hand, it's like you get a personal trainer, you sort of um, throw away all your junk food in your house. Or you, so you make it easier to eat healthier. You like put your shorts right next to your, your shoes. It's making it easier for you to do the right thing. Right. Uh, Right, totally. I mean, I think, I I think a lot about like instead of trying to focus on just purely building willpower, like mastering environment design, so that my goals are easier to achieve or harder. So like, you know, and and conversely, like what you just said about, um, you know, like making making things easier. There's also it also applies the other way, like making mm. things harder, right? So yeah. so like for my drinking thing, like I will, you know if there's like beer in the fridge and like leftover from the weekend for my roommates, I'll just throw it out and give them five bucks. Yeah. Like I'll just, I'll just, <laughs> you know, like make it harder. Cause I know it's, I'm, I'm too lazy to go to the store or. You yeah. Know. You're going to be like, Oh, it'd be nice to have a drink right now. But if I have to walk across the street, you have a exactly. time to be like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? And then you can bail. Um, yep. It's like people who put their credit cards in the freezer um, I think this is like a Whoa. genius. Have you heard of this? So no. if we're trying to shop less or spend less money, there's a thing where you like put your thing into a bucket of water and then put that into the freezer. And so if you see something online that you want to buy, you can buy it. But first you have to take the bucket out and wait for it to melt so you can get the credit card. And by that time you might just be like, oh, you know what? I, I don't really, I don't really need this. And you, you put it back in there. Um, that's awesome. So it's just making it harder, right? I, I, I think that, yeah, people don't think about that. Have you, have you read the book Mindless Eating? No, but I, I've heard a little bit about it. It's, what have you gotten from that? I mean, it's so fascinating. Just, I've gotten from it just a lot. It just so much of it is about like, is in a, about like our consumption habits, our like environment design. Um, and there's just so much that you can do. Like most people, we don't, we eat the container size right? We eat the plate. We don't actually right. eat what we're hungry. So right. like you can just do so many different things in your life to change the environment. Like for example, like at a restaurant, as soon as I get my plate, I can just ask them, I can preempt them bring out my plate by saying, can you put half on the plate and half to go? And mm. you're naturally going to eat less. Yeah. Or you can do things like, you know, ask them not to bring out the bread if you're trying to watch carbs 
Or mm -hmm. you can do things like, you know, ne like if you're using Tupperware to store your food, like never eat out of the Tupperware. Like put it into a bowl so that you can regulate your portion right around what you're hungry versus like, you know, just because you're going to finish the Tupperware, like whatever it is, what's in the Tupperware. And it's just right. like very, just so much of our eating um, is dictated by these external cues and even even things around like oh it's 12 30 well that's what time we go to eat lunch i'm not hungry right. yeah. uh but i want to break up my time and i guess i should go to eat lunch um i mean I, I i taught a class about um will the science of willpower and habits and one of the things that i talk about in the very beginning is that we need to move away from the language of like oh society is degenerated and now we like spend so much time on Facebook and eat all this junk food and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's true that, you know, we're getting more obese as a society or getting more sedentary as a society and all those things are not good. But I think we need to remove the guilt because the fact is that marketers, uh, there are millions of people whose full-time job it is to sit there and strategize and think about ways to get you to buy more things, eat more things, watch more things, use more things. That's all they do. Who's on the other side? It's you. You by yourself at versus millions of dollars and thousands of people in a company strategizing on like, what's the packaging going to look like? How much are we going to sell it for? Like, how are you going to make the flavor taste just right? So you got to have another one, you know? Um, and I said that this class is like self-defense, right? Um, and that it's not that your willpower is getting worse necessarily, but that everything around you is getting more addictive. Uh, right. You know, back again, going back to the tribal era, like, you know, fat and sugar were in low supply. If you got your hands on some fat, you got your hands on some sweet stuff, like eat it, man. Cause like, that's going to tide you over to, for the next two weeks, uh, for whatever you can get next. But when you go to a grocery store and there's a million packages of Cheetos and like Snickers everywhere, it no longer serves us to like eat all the fat and sugar we can get, but that's sort of what we're wired to do. Right. You know, it's, I, I now feel guilty because I love guys like Derek Halpern where it's like play on the social, like play on the psychological cues of, you know, people to get them to do whatever. Um, yeah. but yeah, that, that is such an interesting way to look at this stuff that, you know, we really are like at odds with, you know, a, a huge army of people that are trying to vie for our time and attention. Right. And I think that's always been a self, self help personal development thing is sort of like, you know, if you're not running on your plan, you're operating on someone else's plan, right? Like you're either, you know, running, you know, creating your own destiny or, or you're part of someone else's system that's serving them and not you. Right. Right. So talk to me a little bit about some of the, the key concepts from that class you taught um, <clears throat> about willpower and behavior change. Yeah. So um, it's interesting because the deeper you dive into something, the less like simple it gets. Um, so the first layer is that willpower is limited, uh, that it appears that when you task, task, they've done lots of studies over the years where if you task someone's uh, willpower in one way, they are they perform worse on other tests of willpower, even if they like when they're fresh or when they did something else, they aren't as like they don't do as badly. So an example of this is you have some group of people uh, eat, you know, everybody stops eating for 24 hours, comes into the studio, one group gets to eat like cookies, the other group gets to see the cookies but has to eat like beets, right? So they both eat, they're not eating a lot. And then, the, but like one group kind of like felt satisfied and got to like, you know, indulge in these cookies. The other group had to kind of like fight, uh, use their willpower to like watch this other group eat cookies. Then they both go into some other thing where they have to solve this maze and they, it's like an unsolvable maze, but they, they want you to spend as much time as you can. And the people who ate the cookies last longer than the people who ate the beets. They kind of quit sooner. They're like, screw this. Like. And you already didn't get to eat cookies, and now I have to do this stupid test. Like, I'm done. You know, like, and they'll quit sooner. Um, so a lot of studies like this that kind of suggest that willpower is is somehow limited in some capacity and can be regenerated when you get rest periods and when you sort of replenish it in certain things. But uh, that 
therefore, a lot of what your focus should be on is removing distractions, removing right. temptations, rather than just being like, I got to work harder, right? If you hear someone fail at something and you hear them fail about like, oh, you know, I was really trying not to, to drink a lot. I was really trying to sleep more this week, but like something has happened, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to try harder next week. Like that is like the sound of failure <laughs> happening. Like the phrase, I'm just going to try harder. Uh, yeah. Like there needs to be something happening because trying harder generally doesn't work unless your motivation is like through the roof for some particular reason. And that usually doesn't last. Um, so diving deeper into it, then more studies have shown that potentially there are certain situations where you can sort of like restock your willpower or like if you, um, you know, think like if you think about, uh, experience, you know, I, I can't remember all the studies now, but if you think about like, um, something that you personally believe in a lot or you think about your own values and how they relate to whatever task it is that you're going to do, you can kind of like get a boost, right? And um, there are all these things that sort of mitigate this this concept of willpower is limited, but that's sort of the first pass, willpower is limited. Second pass is there are like advanced willpower hacking tactics, which, uh, you know, most people like to get into the advanced tricks and stuff when really they should just be thinking about the fundamental, which is... It's like pickup lines, Right. It's like the same exact thing. People want the silver bullets, but just start with the core. Start with the core, which is like, you know, wear a nice shirt and be clean and, you know, well-dressed when smiling when you talk to somebody, right? Right. Um, Dude, that's awesome. That's such an interesting insight. The idea of willpower as a diminishing resource and, you know, the op- the way to manage it is to, you know, manage your environment, which is what it sounds like. Yeah, manage your environment and create habits is the second part of it. Yeah. Um, habits are these, you know, we have so many habits uh, about what we do and they don't really use willpower. Willpower be, appears to be this sort of new uh, part of our brain that um, is like kind of a recent thing. Like your dog doesn't have willpower. I mean, mostly speaking, he sees a car, he chases the car. You know, he smells something good, he runs at it. Like they just do that. Like. The only time a dog's using willpower is like when you tell it to sit and it really wants to go do something, but it's like trying to sit. Like that is a dog using willpower, but 99% of the time it is just doing whatever it thinks of like immediately. And willpower is sort of this new invention that we have that allows us to sort of like blunt our immediate response. But because it's so limited, uh, we can only use so much of it. Habits are a more ingrained, deeper part of us that it's like it's stuff that we do without thinking. You know, it's like right. we open up our inbox and we click on these three links and we look at them. Or you know, whenever you are like, there are some people who like smoke only when they're drinking, right? It's like as soon as they start drinking, they're like, oh, I gotta smoke. You know, it's it's this weird habit, but it's like it's set up so that they just they don't have to. They don't think I'm drinking. You know, what would be good is if I if I also got a cigarette. It's just like the immediate yep. feeling. Yep. happens and so what you want to do is develop these habits for yourself uh, and then they're sort of running on autopilot um, and so you can kind of like continue to like divert your willpower off of these habits and you just get them get yourself to do them automatically and then save your willpower for the like the tough new thing that's coming your way yeah no that's that's great makes makes total sense so the last thing I wanted to chat about is I saw you're coming out with a book yeah uh, which is awesome so so tell me about the book. It's called Winning Isn't Normal, right? Yeah. So Winning Isn't Normal is a collection of some of the best articles that I've written about you know, entrepreneurship, fitness, and personal development over the past couple of years. I realized at one point that I just have sort of, I've written hundreds of posts and it, it, you know, I'd like to sort of uh, capstone this in a way with some of the, the best articles because I know that people have started reading my stuff maybe recently, maybe a long time ago, and they haven't. You know, you don't always get everything. And so this is sort of like a best of um, first edition. I've gone back and re-edited a lot of the posts. So Winning Isn't Normal was like my first breakout article. And it's about how if you want to win, you have to do what people aren't doing because winning is not commonplace. Winning isn't what happens to everybody. It's only what happens. Like in a race of 100 people, only one person wins. So by definition, it's like an uncommon, not natural, not normal thing. And if you find yourself doing all the normal things, then it's unlikely that you're going to get an unnormal outcome of, of winning. Uh, 
So the book is divided into three sections, mind, body, and work. Mind is sort of like psychology, you know, rejection therapy like stories, um, writing about re being relentless and resourceful. Uh, body is about some of the things I learned from being a, a, you know, a nationally competitive gymnast, from going, uh, recovering from a really bad knee injury to returning to competition, and, and then getting into running and, and running a marathon, even though I, I'm not the best runner, but, but like the, those experiences are really powerful. Um, and the final section is called work, and it's about uh, being more effective in your work, uh, being more productive, some of the behavior change stuff, some of the like how to write a good email introduction, you know, how to, you know, coffee meetings and how, how that plays a role in, in, in your networking success. So uh, you can learn more about the book uh, on my website. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> uh, left, left, it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> It, uh, at jasonshen.com slash uh, winning dash isn't dash normal. Uh, that's awesome. Jason Shen with an S. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you can put a link I'll somewhere. Link, I, will link, yeah. I will link the crap out of that. Um, yeah. Awesome, man. Well, it has been such a pleasure um, having you on here. So if people want to find you online, jasonshen.com is the best place to go? Yeah, jasonshen.com. And I tweet at also at Jason Shen. So it's very... It's very consistent. Awesome. Yeah. I, lo I love the congruence. Um, yeah. Dude, this has been so much fun. Scott, uh, this is a, a pleasure, and I really uh, an honor to be on the, on the site. So thank you. All right, man. Take it easy. Yeah, you too.